Welcome to Grandma's Guide to Identifying and Understanding Romanesque Architecture. You might wonder why I'm making this video since there are already several on YouTube on this very topic, but I'm concerned with the errors that they contain and the fact that some people have left messages to say that they have used them in their exams and in papers for school. So I want to put some of the errors to right. Firstly, about the use of the term Romanesque. It might suggest that it's grown directly out of the Roman, but this isn't quite the case. The name Romanesque was not used until the 19th century. It wasn't used at all during the period that really concerns us. It was invented um, in order to define this style of medieval architecture from the style Gothic that has the pointed arches. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see one little Gothic chapel to the side with a pointed arch that differs from everything else in the picture. The rest of the building is plainly Romanesque. It's very important to know whether you're looking at an ancient Roman building or a Romanesque building. The building currently on screen is an ancient Roman building. It's the famous Colosseum. And when we look at it, we see that it indeed has round topped arches uh, in the same manner as Romanesque. But everything else about it is very different. The architecture is extremely formal. Um, every part of it is set down by a stylistic rule known as an order. We can see two orders here. If you look at the capitals at, on the columns at the bottom, you can see that they're a scroll type known as Ionic. And when you look at the ones above, they are a, a more floral type known as Corinthian. Romanesque builders were far less tightly governed by rules and the sculptors who ornamented the buildings based their designs on local traditions rather than a set of orders. This magnificent ruin, of which only about a third is intact, is the Basilica of Maxentius. It's another ancient Roman structure and it demonstrates Roman engineering. Those arches are enormous and behind each of one, each of them is what you call a barrel vault, spanning a vast space and soaring up to tremendous height. The techniques to construct an engineering marvel such as this were lost with the fall of Rome and the buildings fell into ruin because the Rome shrank it down to the size of a village inside its ancient walls. Many of the buildings were later used as quarries by people who didn't really appreciate the marble, marvels of these buildings or need buildings as large as these specific purposes. One of the schools of the Romans was to build domes and this dome on the Pantheon in Rome was the widest dome built until the 20th century. I want to point out here a number of reasons why we are looking at an ancient Roman building rather than a Romanesque building. Firstly, the little window-like openings around the dome are all rectangular in shape, not arched, and above each one of them is a little triangular pediment. You won't find that in Romanesque architecture. And if you look below at the lower story you can see here, there are large Corinthian columns supporting a straight cornice. Um, now, you won't find that in Romanesque architecture either. They almost always stood arches on their columns rather than giving it a straight architrave the way you see here. In Rome, the ancient Christian churches, like the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore here, from the 4th century, formed a sort of a link with the Romanesque architecture that was to come. This smaller building, uh, the tomb of Constantine's daughter, Santa Costanza, 
is also very influential. And you see here the arches sitting directly on the Roman columns, as was to be later um, a feature of Romanesque architecture. But in general, even in Italy, there is a distinct gap between the Roman and the Romanesque. Here we see the Romanesque Baptistry of San Giovanni in Florence. This splendid building, Santa Maria Lac in Germany, demonstrates many of the features of fully fledged Romanesque. These features include round arches, paired arched topped windows, a multitude of towers of different shapes including octagonal, and a row of little arches called a Lombard course running around just under the roof line. By the year 1000, Romanesque had developed into a distinct style with recognisable character. This is the Abbey Church of Lesse in France. And this is the Collegiate Church at Tom in Poland. It was a style that stretched right across Europe and continued to develop into the 12th century. This is Durham Cathedral in the far north of England, one of the most magnificent Romanesque churches ever built. Local and imported traditions both played a part in the development of Romanesque architecture. This is the interior of the palace chapel that was built for the Emperor Charlemagne round about the year 800 and it shows many characteristics of Byzantine architecture from Eastern Europe. Its design is based on the Byzantine church in San, of San Vitale in Ravenna on the eastern coast of Italy. An early forerunner of Romanesque is the church of Santa Maria Naranco in Spain, which was previously a royal palace. Uh, you can see the uh, typical arches resting on columns. St Michael's Hildesheim is one of the earliest Romanesque churches in Germany. And from England we have the church of St Lawrence, Bradford-on-Avon, which is Anglo-Saxon. And here's the Tower of Earls Barton Church, also in England also Anglo-Saxon. As you can see, it's a very crude um, style of architecture compared with fully fledged Romanesque. The little arches over the windows are each uh, topped with a single piece of stone, very crudely carved into a sort of a squashed arch. Fully fledged Romanesque architecture didn't arrive into England until the Norman conquest of 1066. And for that reason, Romanesque in England is generally known as Norman architecture. Although Romanesque architecture was used for houses, castles, and civic buildings, we tend to associate the style with churches more than anything else. One of the reasons for this is that across Europe, churches have survived in greater numbers than any other type of Romanesque building. There are two ways in which the Roman Catholic Church fostered the spread of Romanesque architecture through monasteries, and through pilgrimage. In 529, a holy man called Benedict of Norcia set up a monastery on a rock here in Subiago in Italy. He brought together a band of monks who lived lives of prayer, humility, poverty, and hard work. From here, Benedictine monasticism spread out all over Europe 
There are a great number of Benedictine monasteries in England, including the one that produced Westminster Abbey. Wherever monasticism spread, so did Romanesque architecture. Here is the Abbey of Sonor in France. The huge abbey at Cluny in France was particularly influential. Unfortunately, only a very small part of it remains, which can be seen in the centre of this picture. The second important factor associated with the church that brought about the spread of Romanesque architecture was pilgrimage. Christians made long pilgrimages to churches that were associated either with a significant event, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, or the remains of a person regarded as a miracle-working saint, like Canterbury Cathedral, where Thomas Becket was martyred. One of the most important places for pilgrimage was the Church of Santiago de Compostela, where St James the Great is buried in northern Spain. The major churches like Canterbury and Santiago grew so rich that the churches themselves have been changed so much it is very hard to find remnants of the Romanesque architecture, particularly on the exterior of the building. Less significant churches like the Abbey of St Foy at Conx have fared better when it comes to retaining their Romanesque architecture. Churches that house the remains of important saints like St Albans in England are often extremely long, this one's over 500 feet, so that people can gather in the nave and the clergy can hold processions. In discussing Romanesque architecture, I have mentioned three different types of churches. There are parish churches, abbey churches associated with monasteries, and cathedrals. Of these, cathedrals are generally the grandest because they contain the cathedra, the seat of a bishop. Speyer Cathedral in Germany is built of red stone and the green of its roofs is oxidised copper. Speyer Cathedral had many architectural innovations and was very influential on Romanesque architecture of other churches in Germany. Here is the ground plan of a fairly simple church in Spain, San Isidoro. Firstly, the illustration has been arranged to indicate the orientation of the church. Um, normally there would be an apse with the altar in it to the east and the main door to the west. Nearly all churches of this period are east-west orientated, apart from in Italy where they seem to be arranged in any direction whatsoever. You'll notice that there is also a significant door, or two significant doors, to uh, the south of the church, and there's a porch of some sort to the west. Internally, we can see that there is a central space called the nave, and on either side are aisles. The nave is divided from the aisles by two rows of columns which would be supporting arches. Uh, running north-south across the church is the arms called the transepts. The nave of the church is where the congregation would usually sit or stand to worship. Here is a very much larger church. This is Ely Cathedral in England. And it has many of the same features. The nave, the aisles, the transept. But here we see that the end with the apse is very much longer. This is where the priests or monks would usually worship. And the nave is also very much longer uh, because there would be grand religious occasions take place at the cathedral and also there would be processions. There are two other important features that we can see in this picture. 
Firstly, the west front, which is very elaborate and has small towers and a very large tower, which isn't apparent in this picture. And also we can see four piers near the centre of the church, which once held a large tower. This ground plan of Ely is a historical reconstruction. Um, several of the features of the church have changed considerably, including the central tower. We must always remember that a Romanesque church may have been changed many times over 900 or 1,000 years. This reconstructed cross-section of Constance Cathedral uh, shows a typical arrangement of central nave divided from the aisles on either side by two rows of columns supporting rows of arches. There are windows above, which are called the clerestory windows, which are over the roof of the side aisles. In this picture you can also see uh, the apse at the end containing an altar and a flat wooden ceiling which was typical of most Romanesque churches. Here's an interior view showing one of the walls with arches along it supported, in this case, on piers rather than columns. The windows at the bottom are shining through the aisles and the ones up above are in the region called the clerestory, which is over the roof of the aisles. So there are two rows of windows to light the interior of the church. The windows are not particularly large because originally they wouldn't have been glazed. By 1100, most large churches would have had glass in them and consequently windows got considerably larger. The little row of openings along above the nave arcade are uh, a gallery. There's actually a walking space going along there underneath the roof. This is an external view of a bay of a uh, Peterborough Cathedral and you can see three stages, the aisle at the bottom, the clerestory at the top and in between them a gallery under the roof of the aisle. Other features that you can see here are the flat buttresses and a small blind gallery, little row of columns and arches that go along uh, close to the roof line in this case. Small rows of arches like that were one of the most important types of Romanesque architectural decoration, both internally and externally. And here's a drawing of the Abbey Church at Cluny. Among the features that you can see are the apse at the eastern end, with a row of small semicircular apses around it, a profusion of towers, and two more towers at the western end, marking the important west front. Now to look at some of the specific features of Romanesque. One of the most significant is that the, the churches often look very stocky and strong and fortress-like. The walls are often very thick. This particular church is in Italy. And this one is in France. And here's an example from Belgium with the development of buttresses seen here at Durham Cathedral. Walls could be made thinner and windows could be made larger. Other features that can be seen here are the clerestory, the windows into the arcade and the windows into the aisles. Below the aisle windows the wall has been made thinner by the inclusion of arcading. Durham is altogether a very innovative building. Now to look at the west front of some churches and see how they are typically constructed. This is the church of San Zeno in Verona in Italy and its main claim to fame is that this is where Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet were married in the crypt. In this type of facade, the front of the church 
clearly indicates the shape of the church behind it, which we just saw in the cross section of the church in Constance. The church has a small porch in which the columns rest on the back of lions and it has a, a wheel window, which is a type of rose window that was the most common during the Romanesque period. Notice also the blind arcade that goes across the front of the building. There are no towers because in Italy towers were usually freestanding from the rest of the structure. The church of Saint Trophime in Arles in France is renowned for its magnificent portico. Uh, you'll notice that set within the arch there is um, an arch-shaped piece of sculpture which is called the tympanum and I'll get back to that more a little later. The other thing to observe is that you can see clearly where the nave and the aisles fall by looking at the exterior of the building. Like the other two, you can see the positions of the nave and aisles clearly marked by the facade of this building. This is the front of Pisa Cathedral and it's notable for its arcading, for its polychrome, its two coloured or more than two coloured marble decoration and its triple portico. In Italy, uh, ancient Roman architecture is reflected in Romanesque architecture more than in any other country. And one of the features is this triple doorway, which is like an ancient Roman triumphal arch. This feature also appears in French Romanesque buildings. This is the cathedral where the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa is found. It's the Campanile or a bell tower of this cathedral. Here is the ancient Roman Arch of Constantine in Rome showing the feature that was adapted in Romanesque architecture. The French church of Le Puy en Valais shows this triple arch motif used for the entrances to the church and then more arches above um, in shape of windows and other arches which are blind arcading and other arches which are open arcading forming two little pinnacles. So we move into another type of facade, um, the sort that has small pinnacles or towers on either side rather than large fully constructed towers. These small arches may once have held six bells. A similar effect was created here at Saint-Pierre Angoulême, also in France. Here by contrast is Southern Minster in England with two large towers. You notice that the windows are quite small and that the towers are supported by flattened buttresses. There's a single arched doorway without a tympanum. Don't be confused by that very large window. That's a much later addition. It's very much in the Gothic style. A close-up shows the Gothic pointed arches of the window and the delicate tracery, which indicates that it is not Romanesque. All of England's important twin-towered Romanesque facades um, on great churches like this have had a large perpendicular Gothic window inserted uh, once they were able to do so to let more light into the church. Here's the twin-towered facade of Lisbon Cathedral in sunny Portugal uh, where there's still a deeply set rose window a large arch to the door so that a feature of the facade is the stunning contrast of light and shade. The Abbey Les Hommes, the Abbey of the Men, 
in Combe in northern France has survived intact to show us what many other abbey churches possibly looked like. It still has its three doorways, its rows of neat Norman windows, its towers with arcading and paired windows near the top, which is the typical Romanesque feature, and some slightly later spires. Les Orms became a model for the facades of Gothic churches, such as Notre Dame in Paris, Reims Cathedral, Léon Cathedral, and many others. German churches, particularly in the vicinity of the Rhine, like Santa Maria Lac shown here, have west ends with apses in a similar manner to the east end and elaborate structures called west works. You notice there are round towers and square towers and a large porch at the front. Here is a similar structure at the Cathedral of Worms in Germany. Smaller churches often have a single tower at the western end or a single tower at the crossing. Very large churches often had multiple towers um, over the west front at the crossings and in this case over one of the transepts at Cluny. And here is the magnificent central tower of Tewkesbury Abbey, the largest Norman tower in England. This tower shows many important features to look for on a Romanesque building. Notice the blind arcading near the bottom and then there are paired openings under two arches. Above that there are three openings and then there are um, another series of three openings with shafts separating them and then above that four. So the number is increasing each time and uh, that's a typical pattern of Romanesque towers. We see them both in France and Italy and sometimes in Spain. And here's an example from San Frediano in Lucca in Italy. Notice there's only one window at the bottom which increases to two, three, three slightly larger, four, and four slightly larger still. Typical pattern of towers in Italy. And of course I have to put in the most famous tower of them all, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, with its polychrome marble, its arcading at the bottom, and rows and rows of arcades all the way up, um, each slightly wider on one side than the other, which gives it a very curious look. Your eyes are not playing tricks. They tried to adjust it because the building started to subside shortly after construction commenced. Now to look in more detail at a typical Romanesque doorway. You'll notice that over the doorway there's a semicircular arch and that the transoms on either side are straight. The arch is in three bands and in between the three bands it's set with circular shafts and a circular moulding that goes um, between the various arches. Those wedge-shaped stones that have been cut carefully to give maximum strength to the arch are called voussoirs. Now you'll notice that on each, the top of each of those shafts there's a little carved capital and that the mouldings are also carved with decoration. The shafts, mouldings and capitals around the door are among the most decorated parts of any Romanesque building. Here is the door of Lincoln Cathedral, one of the most splendid Romanesque portals in England. 
Uh, don't be distracted by the row of little Gothic kings which is set above it and slightly encroaches on it. This close-up of the details of the portal of Lincoln show, starting at the right, medallions containing paired creatures, which is in the Byzantine manner. And then in the next band, we've got motives drawn from illuminated manuscripts with scrolling, leafy uh, tendrils and little figures among them, hunting, doing other things. And then there's a band of barbaric heads um, with beards. And then two rows of chevrons. This portal from Avila shows, uh, rather than the um, mouldings being decorated, it's the flat surfaces of the voussoirs, which each has a floral motif carved into it. And um, then the abacus of the columns that runs in a continuous band has similar um, floral and strapwork motifs, and the columns themselves are carved into paired beasts. So there's some variation on the way in which these motives are used, depending on the particular building or the local tradition. As I indicated earlier, the Romanesque sculptor had a great deal more freedom than any ancient Roman sculptor could ever hope for. Um, the wealth of decorative strap work um, twisting and twining and sprouting with leaves um, along these capitals is absolutely fantastic. And we also have, of course, the motive of the paired birds. There's a quaint little figure hiding in the corner. And don't miss the angel flying in from the right-hand side. Some Romanesque churches have a wealth of figurative carving. This is from Saint Trophime at Arles, and you can see King Herod very angry as he draws his sword while confronting the free wise men. And don't miss the grinning lions in the band up above. This beautifully detailed capital shows another gospel story Jesus, to the far right, is washing the disciples' feet and St Peter holds his head as he looks on in shame that his Lord should be serving him instead of the other way around. Um, notice the draperies and the um, sharp lines forming pattern and fold. Probably Romanesque's greatest contribution to the art of sculpture is the tympanum set above the door over the straight lintel and uh, we're seeing here the portal of the church of Saint Trophime at Arles. Also from France is this magnificent portal from the Abbey of Saint Pierre Moissac. The details here from Saint Pierre show us Christ in majesty. He's surrounded by the four holy beasts who represent um, a vision from the Old Testament and the um, symbols of the four apostles. So there is um, the um, eagle of St John, the winged man of St Matthew, the winged lion of St Mark and the winged bull of St Luke. On either side there are uh, archangels. And on either side of that, there are rows of prophets who are playing stringed instruments. The most typical subject matter for these portals is the Last Judgment, where Christ is shown um, judging both the living and the dead, consigning some to hell with his left hand, and welcoming others into heaven with his right. Around the outside are carved roundels which show the labours of the months and the signs of the zodiac. The signs of the zodiac were seen as the way that God ordered his year and put stars in the sky by which men knew the seasons. These scenes of the Last Judgment were a very important warning to Christians of what was to come. Um, in churches in England where there is a less strong tradition of portal sculpture, they were often painted above the chancel arch. 
This one is from Clayton in Sussex. This one is from Segovia in Spain. Here we step inside the interior of a simple but intact Romanesque church of an early date in Italy. And this is um, Santa Maria Cosmaden in which we see the recycled Roman columns. Flat wall surfaces which would once have been frescoed. A simple arch over the chancel and little windows letting the light in. One important feature is the open wooden roof where we can see the beams. This is the most common type of roof in small Romanesque churches. The Church of St Michael's Hildesheim has more Romanesque features because there's no recycled ancient Roman columns here. We see columns which are definitely Romanesque, separated by rectangular piers. The other very important feature here is the wooden ceiling, which was another common ceiling type. And here it has retained its medieval painting. The Church of saint Savin in France has a simple barrel vault, which was common particularly for the uh, lower aisles, but here seen over the nave, painted with frescoes and supported on columns. When two barrel vaults cross each other at 90 degrees, then a groin vault is achieved. The Romans used groin vaults frequently and they could make them very large and cover vast structures with them. But um, th this was not really possible with the engineering skills of the Middle Ages. You can see the, the uh, groins here marked very clearly because somebody has slightly enhanced them, made them more prominent. Uh, one of the advantages is that they could sit on columns as they do here. This is the crypt of Worcester Cathedral. Here we see a barrel vault enhanced and strengthened by the use of ribs which spring from attached shafts that run up the wall of the nave on either side. Ribs could be used in a similar manner to enhance the groins of a groin vault as we see here in one of the aisles at Peterborough Cathedral in England. The rib vault was an enormously important development in architectural engineering. It meant that the um, surfaces of the vault could be much thinner and lighter weight than a barrel vault would be or even a groin vault. And that allowed the roof to be higher. It allowed uh, the windows in Clerestory to be larger. And the shape of the vault eventually led to the pointed arches that we associate with Gothic architecture and some of the most magnificent creations of the medieval period. Here is the magnificent sexpartite or six part vault at Saint Etienne, the Abbey Les Hommes at Com in France. This interior of Saint Etienne shows a highly developed Romanesque style. Rectangular piers with attached shafts, ornamented capitals. On the next level, we have a gallery, and above that, a clerestory. So the building rises in three stages and it's Romanesque vault with semicircular arches have um, all the arches resting on the fine shafts run down the wall. Here is the interior of another important French pilgrimage church, the Madeleine Vaiselay, said to hold the body of St Mary Magdalene. Um, very different in appearance to the church at Con, with its 
um, polychrome stonework, but also showing the uh, rectangular piers with attached shafts, in this case in bundles running up the wall. There's only two stages, the arcade and the cloistry. The eastern end is Gothic. Speyer Cathedral in Germany is one of the most influential buildings, but unfortunately what we're seeing here is very largely 19th century rebuilding, as the church has had an unfortunate history and um, has partly fallen down on a couple of occasions. By contrast with some of the French buildings, this church at Tournou in Belgium is extremely simple. Plain rectangular piers, three large arches bridging the nave, and very simple clerestory windows. Structurally, this church of San Miniato al Monte in Florence, Italy, is quite similar to the church at Tournou, except the obvious difference is that it has Roman style columns where the Belgian church has rectangular piers. The other big difference is in the decoration. Many churches around Florence have inlaid marble in different colours, polychrome, and at the end, over the apse, is a mosaic. The majority of England's medieval cathedrals, and most of its abbeys, many of which were later ruined, were begun in the Romanesque or Norman period. Here we see the Cathedral of Peterborough, which is one of the most intact. Like St. Etienne in Conn, it has a three-stage elevation, and it has shafts running up the wall, which may have been intended to support a vault. Its roof, however, is medieval and still has its medieval painting. The pointed arches under the tower are Gothic. Beyond doubt, one of the finest Romanesque churches, one of the greatest churches in the world, is Durham Cathedral in the north of England. We can see here several of its remarkable features. Its nave has ultimately huge round columns separated by complex rectangular piers with lots of moulded shafts which are semicircular. The tops of its arches are worked with decorative ornament. Above that is an arcade of paired arches set under a single arch and over that under the vault is a clerestory. The vault has ribs and one of the unique features of Durham is that the semicircular ribs uh, alternating with pointed ribs, which can be seen here in the transverse rib halfway down the nave. Another important feature are the flying buttresses, which are hidden under the roof of the side aisles and help support the high vault. Another important feature is the decoration on the huge circular piers, which, though on the nearest ones, is a sort of fluting and further down is chevrons and there are also spirals. Like most of England's Romanesque buildings, Durham has been added to in various ways, including the rose window that is visible at the end and the tops of all the towers on the outside. Stained glass windows were an important innovation during this period. This is one of a group of windows which are the earliest surviving, intact, still in their location. They're from Augsburg Cathedral and this particular window represents King David. One of the most magnificent windows is this crucifixion from Poitiers Cathedral in France. I'll just list some of the important features of Romanesque architecture as a reminder. 
Firstly, arches are round-headed, whether they're in doorways, windows, or in the arcades of the nave, or decorating the front of a building. Mouldings are simple. They're either square or circular, not elaborate as they were to become during the Gothic period, and as they had been in the, in the ancient Roman period. Large buildings were in three stages, the aisles, gallery and clerestory. Walls were thick and solid and the buttresses were flat. Windows were often grouped or they were paired under a single arch. Blind arcades were used as decoration on both the exterior and interior of the building. Arcades were often found just below the roof line. Windows, circular windows, when they were used, are generally wheel windows. Towers came in a multitude of shapes, including octagonal, square and round. They could be capped with a spire covered with metal, such as copper or lead, or with tiles or slate. Plans of large churches were in a cross shape with a long nave and a transept and a chancel. The chancel was at the east and the main entrance was at the west. While the body of a small church might be of a single cell, the body of a large church generally had a nave framed by lower aisles separated by arcades. The arcade could be supported by round columns, square piers, or very large round piers built of masonry and filled with a core of rubble. These large round piers were often incised with decorations in the forms of spirals or chevrons. Roofs were either open and timber or else had barrel vaults or groin vaults. Barbaric ornament of various kinds was very popular, particularly on the outside of the church, and gave a lot of freedom for invention. Another pattern that was often used was the chevron. Mouldings were often decorated with spiral or floral patterns, and capitals were often figurative and could show paired beasts. The most decorative part of the building is generally the portals of the West Front. These characteristics make Romanesque a distinctive and unified style that can be recognised right across Europe. The illustrations have all come from Wikimedia Commons and I would like to thank all those people who have been so generous with their talents as to freely upload these pictures for people to use and for educational purposes.